Sometimes, when you're on the water, you may find yourself like me, thinking about that seemingly mythical place where the trout are everywhere. That place where no one except you and your friends know about. That place where you can guarantee success every time. All of us fishermen hunger for that place. Some of us even find it. Those three. <laughs> I think I have four there, so. This is your mayfly go to, right? This is it. Luckily, there's no name for it, so people can't just look it up. That's right. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Scott Anderson and uh, I've been on the Eastern Shore for about 16 years. I'm a, a minister at a church here and I, um, I came to the Eastern Shore about a year before I, um, I moved here for the purpose of checking out the trip. Um, I think for me, brook trout, is, it's, it's more than the trout, it's the wilderness experience. Um, my favorite way to fish is uh, in a canoe with a fly rod and going into wilderness locations. That, it's almost like I like the idea of, of that, getting away from civilization, getting away from the noise and going to a location with a canoe that you can't normally get to and a tent, but be able to also pursue trout. And so for me, um, that's the full package that trout offers. And to me, what's so special about trout is it's a huge indicator of wilderness, um, native brook trout. So to go to a place where you can still catch native brook trout, um, healthy native brook trout, it's about going back in time. It's about uh, the recognition that I'm in a place that has been protected. It's a place that's still left in this world. And uh, my thought is, don't give up those places. You have to protect them. And you have to be very careful because, again, um, their lakes and systems in Nova Scotia are small. They're extremely sensitive. And it, I don't think it takes a whole lot to impact that uh, trout ecosystem. So they're very, very special. And so for me, um, you know, you take a few fish, I take a couple fish, but I catch and release the majority. Um, but those special honey holes, you have to be very careful, yeah. So we're about a, a half an hour hike um, back to the main lake, and then we take a boat, canoe or an outboard boat, one or the other depending on weather, up the lake, which is probably about a 45 minute paddle or so, and then we go over a hill into another lake, and then we cross that lake and go through the woods to the last lake. So it's about an hour and a half, probably, uh, two hours in total to get back there, which I think, I think that's one of the reasons it's such a great spot. Yeah. Stop for a breather, let me know. Yeah, this sounds good. <sighs> this guy's an animal. Holy smokes. <laughs> Been hiking here, what is it like? Probably like 26 degrees. Black flies everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now, if I'm being honest, I was super excited. Scott had been sending me photos and telling me stories of this place for a while. Well, the good thing is it's warmer than yesterday. There's a bit of a breeze. The cold we're going into first should be better because the breeze is blowing from the east. Not only are there tons of trout in this lake, but the average size there would be considered a giant where I'm from. Fourteen to eighteen inch brookies, all after one thing. And that one thing had already come and gone. The mayfly hatch was over, and as a result, the larger fish were holding deep. Come on, boy. Take this. Scott was worried this might be the case, as we had an unexpected heat wave come through, and with that came the black flies. Most black flies I think I've ever seen in my life. They're crawling, yep, and they're biting worse than yesterday. Pulls me off a little bit, <laughs> but other than that, I don't know. <laughs> Might get pneumonia. <laughs> Hiking two hours through the woods, enduring thousands of black flies, only to find out that the trout weren't even feeding. You might consider that a fail. I mean, it seems that way. But you must realize one thing. A guy like Scott, who's willing to drag a canoe through the middle of thickets, cross lakes two hours from civilization, and all of that, usually by himself, isn't a guy who just gives up and goes home. Well, I see blood in the bottom of the canoe. Probably from Will. Probably <laughs> Holy from mackerel. He's been nailed by them. There was a, a little spot of blood like that. <sighs> yeah, well. I was going into an area there we're going later. And I, st I started hiking the hike this morning. And my right foot started aching a bit. I got back and I got down the run. And it kept getting a little worse. And I got to the base and I'm like, I must have broke my foot. I'm like, I gotta get out of here. What's wrong? I've, it, the pain was like just getting bad. I got back across the lake and had to crawl, hands and knees. I crawled. I don't know, four or five hundred meters and had a stop on a hill and uh, called a friend. He came in with the ATV, threw me on the back, took me right to the hospital. And I said, I must have broke my foot. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, I had a uh, goat. And uh, a guy that I paddle with is a doctor, and I told him the story, and he said, well, what were you doing? I said, well, that year I was eating a lot of trout. I was eating it for smoking it, eating it for lunch. I mean... I was keeping a lot of trout and eating a lot of trout. And he said, it's, it's a known fact that trout cause goat. Hmm. And he said, they call it trout goat. <laughs> That's crazy. So I backed off the trout. The good thing is, a guy like Scott not only has one honey hole, but he has two.
of course it's rewarding to see a trip pay off. We ended up catching 25 in that hole that day. But something dawned on me while back there. A honey hole had been redefined for me. Not only is it about the quality of fish, but it's just as much about the journey there. It's just as much about the pain and determination it takes to find it. How you can feel so secluded, yet so at peace at the same time. See, all of us fishermen hunger for that place. And all of us have the opportunity to find it. You have to put time in and be willing to, um, to put a lot of hard work in. Um, and I would zone in on the difficult places. And you can look at lakes on the map and you can look at systems and it can indicate this might be a possible spot. I would say talk to some good local people and eventually you put the time in, you're going to find a spot. And I've only had three in my life that I call honey holes, but boy oh boy they were worth it. <laughs> <laughs>